Good evening and welcome. Good to see all of you again. And as has been mentioned, we have visitors with us. And for that, for your presence, we are grateful. I hope the weather turns bad when I leave. <laughs> that way you'll think it was me that brought it. But it has been ideal. And I very much have enjoyed it. And more importantly, have enjoyed our time together. I've been able to be with many of you socially and certainly in our spiritual exercises here. And that's been a real pleasure for me. And I want you to know how much I do appreciate that. The, uh, this is m most of the time where I go and preach, uh, they don't have outline books. And when Herb called me and he said, we need your outlines. I thought, well, I better get some outlines. If we need some outlines, pretty quick. So the outlines are not uh, not real extensive, but hopefully uh, you've been able to at least follow some things as we've talked about that. And I know sometimes the slides help as well. And as you have already seen, sometimes I preach with slides and sometimes I don't preach with slides. So uh, I just hope that you'll uh, acknowledge that and hopefully uh, the things that we're doing will be, will be beneficial and you will gain something as a result. Now if I can find my glasses, we're going to be in business. Uh, I want you to be turning, if you would, to 2 Peter. We're going to look at that again here in just a second. Whew. Ron, I'm, you have to go with me everywhere I go, I guess. I'd, been, I'd be up here all night looking for my glasses, and y'all have been laughing at me. It's all right. I don't mind. I can take it. What we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to talk about walking like he's coming tomorrow. And Brian was right in his opening remarks when he said that has to do with how we live our lives. This passage in 2 Peter 3, I, we, we, we talked to this, I talked a little bit about this on Monday night. Verse 11 says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? You know, if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, we just have to live a certain way. That, that, that we are asked to come out of the world and live in a way that is indicative of the fact that we have faith and we have trust and we have perspective and all those things that we've mentioned. But we are asked to live in a way that, frankly, it seems to me, not a lot of people want to live. And what Peter says is we need to live a life of godliness, and it, it, it amounts to holy conduct. And you've heard lessons, probably series on godliness and holy conduct. But tonight I want to just call your attention to some facets of those things that maybe we forget from time to time. And there are things that we need to think about daily as we consider how we live our lives. Because as we have said, uh, the, the Jesus Christ may come back tomorrow. And we need to constantly be aware of that. And if that's the case, then we need to live accordingly. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, if you'll turn to Ephesians, you're going to be where we're going to spend the majority of our time tonight. Ephesians 4 is the beginning of what I call uh, the responsibility section of the book. I think the first three chapters are relational, and the last three chapters of Ephesians are responsible. It talks about what then are we responsible to do because we have the relationship. It's, it's about the easiest book, in my judgment, in the New Testament to outline for that very reason. But in verse 1 of chapter 4, Paul would say, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And I think that is a good opening statement to what he's wanting them to understand. Walking has to do with how we live our lives. And in chapter 4 and chapter 5, he uses that idea and that imagery considerably to help these people who lived in a in this really pagan society. And, and I would simply say that we're we're that way as well. We live in, a, in an immoral age, and, and I don't know that there's ever been a, a, an age where it was not immoral. There weren't immoral people, but we certainly live in a time where we're called upon to live as God wants us to live. And if we do that, we're going to be seen as different. 
And so when he says these things to them, he says, I want you to walk worthy of the calling. He's saying there, there, is a, there is a way in which you need to walk because you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. We all understand that. But what I want to point out tonight is that there are some things specifically that I think he says about how we do that. And so tonight I'm going to ask you to do what I've always asked you to do since I've been here. And that's to be honest with yourself and evaluate what you do, how you live. We're going to look at it generally but, but as I do that, I'm not going to make a lot of applications because I believe if we learn the principles and if we value the principles, the applications come easy. I really believe that. And I think we're going to see that maybe in some language that Paul uses tonight as he writes to these, these Ephesian Christians. So when you go on down in, in chapter 4 and beginning in verse 17, there is, there is a concept that he talks about that he talks about in several of his epistles. And if he doesn't use the idea of an old man and a new man, he may use other contrasts to help them understand that there is a distinction. And so when he says you need to walk worthy, verse 17 then begins to explore how that happens. And I want to read these verses to you. Before I read them, I want to mention something to you because I want you to be thinking of it as we read these verses together. There are really four aspects of the biblical heart. We think of the four chambers of the heart. And if you want to think about it in that way, you may. But to be even the four chambers biblically, I would say, are first of all, intellect. It's our ability to, to gain information, to acknowledge information, to process and to analyze and conclude and reason. And all those terms that help us understand God's given us that ability to comprehend. And then there is an aspect of our heart spiritually that have to do with emotion. Emotion has to do with what we like or what we don't like. There is a, an, an aspect, if you will, uh, of the heart that's also the, the, the conscience. And that has to do with what's right and what's wrong. And of course, that's gauged based upon uh, what, what the standard of our conscience is. And then finally, there is the will. There is the determination to make a decision. I'm either going to do right or wrong, or it may not be a right or wrong concept, but, but I'm going to choose and I'm going to make a, a choice. I'm going to make a decision. Now, with all those things in mind, it, almost as far as I know, every aspect of our lives and what we're thinking about is summed up in one of those categories. That, that they, may, they may be various aspects of those four that are combined, but, but everything we do relates to one of those or more. Now, I want you to listen. With those things in your mind, just think about what he says beginning in verse 17. He says this, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness and greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. You see that last idea? That ties into what Peter said in 2 Peter 3. That's how we are to live our lives. But I want you to think about this, particularly as it relates to this idea of a change that takes place. He says in verse 17, he says, I don't want you walking. God doesn't walk, want you walking like the Gentiles walk. Listen in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling. See, all those phrases have to do with, with our intellect, with emotion, with conscience and will. All of them. And so what, what he's saying is, you've got to get all that, you've got to get all that under control. And then he goes on to tell them in verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ. That's, that's not the way you live if indeed you heard him and you've been taught by him as truth is in Jesus. In other words, these, these, these disciples to whom he writes, he's saying, you've learned, you've been taught, and so your behavior is different. And, and that really is the concept of behavior. 
It's, what, it, it, it's the way we live our lives. And, and if we're in Christ, and if He's taught us, if we've heard Him and He's taught us, then, then we don't act that way. We, we, don't act the, the, we don't have ignorance anymore, and we're not blinded. And our minds are not futile. All those things that he mentions about how the Gentiles, well, that, that ought not happen to us. But I'm afraid that many times it does. And when we go back to that, we are going to act naturally the way they acted. And he says, you can't do that. You've got to walk with the idea that God could call you home at any time, and you're going to be responsible for how you live. But he says... You've learned that. You need, you need to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And he said, you've learned because you've listened and Jesus has taught you. When I was a, a, a kid, I have two younger sisters. And in the, around Christmas time, we would drive to Alabama to see my dad's parents, my grandparents. And we lived in Arkansas, a little town in Arkansas, as I've told you about. I'm sure all of you remember the name of the town, and I'm sure you're excited about going there at some point in time in your life. But, but that's where we lived. And, and, and uh, during Christmas, we would, we would wake up, and, and, on, and Dad would say, we're going to leave in the morning around 4.30, and we're going we're to drive to Evergreen, Alabama, so we, we can be there for Christmas. And so I remember very well when we bought our first new car. It was a 1967 Pontiac Star Chief Executive. I can still smell it. You know, you know how that new car smells? You, you, you can smell new cars right now, can't you? You're not in it, but you can smell it. You, I, can just, I was going to say I can taste it. I can't taste it. I never ate it, but I could smell it. But I can remember we would get in that car, and, and the back seat, it, it, it had, that, it had those, uh, that vinyl pan, not vinyl paneling, but those vinyl seats, and it would have those little ridges that were raised. And what happened in that, in that Star Chief Executive, the, the back seat was divided into perfect thirds. Perfect thirds. And so we would get in the back seat. Mom and Dad would be in the front. Dad would drive. Mom would be in the passenger seat. I would get in the middle in the back seat. Anita would get to my left and Tamara would get to my right. And we'd begin that journey. Now we began that journey asleep because we left at 4.30 in the morning. Well, about 6 o'clock, the sun just start coming up. And we crossed the bridge in Memphis, crossed the Mississippi River. And of course, when you're from Ball Knob, Arkansas, crossing the bridge in Memphis, that's a big deal. And Dad would wake us up. He'd say, we're getting ready to cross the bridge. And we'd wake up, and we'd get excited. It didn't take long to cross the bridge, but we'd get excited. And so once he, once he woke us up, we'd be awake for a little bit. And what would happen is we, we started, of course, I was in the back seat. Nita was in the back seat. Tam was in the back seat. And... And we started kind of pestering each other. I know you find that hard to believe. But it's kind of what, it's kind of what you know, brothers and sisters do. And I was the oldest. And so we would, we would kind of pester each other. And it started off rather mild. And then it would, it would build. And, and mother would occasionally turn around from the passenger. She, she turned and she said, the kids, we got a long way to go. And, and y'all just need to kind of calm down. We'd say, yeah, mom, maybe everything's good. And we'd be calm for a few minutes. Okay, and then I'd amp it up, and I'd, I, you know, I'd punch, you know, you know how it goes. I'd either punch my sisters or I'd do something. And what really aggravated them? This, this is, this was, this was. I hate to even tell you this because I don't want to give anybody ideas. But here's what I'd do. Mom would say, "Stay in your own section." Remember, it was divided up into thirds, so we each had a third. And what I would do, and I was in, the, I'd take my fingers, and I'd put them right here. And I would barely put my fingers over into their section. And they would go ballistic. They'd start beating on me and punching me. And I loved it. I thought that, I thought because we were really going to get into it. And we do that a couple of times. Until my dad had had all he could take. And I want you to remember where I'm sitting. And I want you to remember where my dad's driving. He was the world's best one-armed driver. He had both arms, but he only used one to drive sometimes because he'd drive looking ahead and he'd reach back. Now, remember where I'm sitting. And when he reached back, it, guess who? It landed on, landed on me. And he, he, would, he would grab me right above my kneecap right there and he would squeeze and he would say, behave. And you know what we did? We behaved, yeah. And you know what we didn't do? 
I never once remember me or either what my sister saying, Dad, would you mind pulling over and explaining to us what you mean? <laughs> never had to do that. You know why? Because we'd already learned what to do. He, he, may had to, he may have had to reprimand us, but we had already learned what to do. So all he had to do is, is to say, you need to behave. That's what I think Paul is saying here. He said, you, you ought to be learning Christ. You ought to be understanding what it is and, and how you ought to live your life and how you ought to walk. And all those things are aspects of that. And that's a difficult thing, I think, sometimes for Christians. And here's why. You know, in, in a, you just think about this. If you have a choice about how you're going to live your life and something may be, it may be a moral issue or, or, or as opposed to an immoral thing, maybe an issue of am I going to do right or wrong? So it's not only your intellect's involved, but your emotions are involved. It's, it's, and, and part of the problem is, is so many of us, this affects young people, but it's not just exclusively young people. It affects all of us. Why do we do what we do? This is one of those brilliant points. You better write this down. You, you're never going to hear anything more profound than what I'm about to say. We do what we do because we like it. None of you are writing. You need to write that down. <laughs> we do what we do because we like it. We, we emotionally, it's something that we like. And the problem for, for most of us is, is if that's what drives our decisions, we're not going to make wise choices. That doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to do some things that He likes, that we like. But He's saying, you've got, to, you've got to somehow corral all four of these things so that they work well together. Your conscience is involved with that. This passage tells us that, remember He said, the way the Gentiles walk, they're past feeling. Remember that phrase? Past feeling. Let me tell you something. You know why people do what they do? Because a lot of them are past feeling. There's no conscience anymore. They don't care anymore. And maybe they've never had much of a conscience. But may I tell you, if that affects us as Christians, that we do what we do simply because it feels good and it's something we like to do, and we don't evaluate whether or not it's right, we've made a terrible mistake. And Paul says, that's not the way Jesus has taught you to live. That's not the way you walk. That's not the way you live your life. You live your life understanding how all four of these things take shape. And what that will, what that will ultimately do, it will cause you to live your life in holiness and godliness. You know, people who don't have a conscience, you know, you know sometimes we look at, at the way people live their lives, and, and I think we're almost amazed that people do that. I'm not amazed, really. You know, we're amazed that, that, that there's so much promiscuity, if that's even a word that we use much anymore, but you understand what I'm saying. The way people live their lives. But you know, may I say something to you? If your conscience doesn't tell you those things are wrong, why wouldn't you live that way? Let me tell you something. If, if I didn't have a conscience telling me as a Christian, I can't do that, I can't engage in that, if I didn't have that telling me I can't do that, that, that would be my lifestyle. Why is that? Because that makes me feel good, right? So, so you have to get all of those things under control. If you're going to walk and live like God wants you to live, all that has to be packaged together and it has to fit. God doesn't say eliminate that drive in your life. He says control it. Control it. Understand that there are other factors involved. It's not just what you want when you want it and how it makes you feel. It's not just about that. And so many of us, let, let me rephrase that. So many people, rather, live their lives doing what makes them feel good. And if you don't have a conscience, then have at it. But understand, that's not how God teaches you. And that's not what's going to please Him. And that's not how a Christian ought to walk. That's what he says. Don't walk like they walk. You walk like somebody who has been taught by Jesus. And that's what all of us have to do. Now, having said all of that, I just want to look at two other passages, both of which are found in Ephesians 5. This is uh, verse 15, beginning in verse 15. Listen to what Paul says now. He says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Look at 16, redeeming the time. 
There's that element. I told you every lesson is going to have that element. The redeeming the time. Why? Because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And I think verse 17 applies in that whole context. But specifically, I think he's saying, if you understand what the word of the Lord is, you're going to, you are, as he says, you're going to be careful. And the word the New King James uses is circumspectly. I like that word. We don't, uh, we don't say it much. We don't say, well, we need to be more circumspect. I mean, that's not the kind of language we typically use when we're talking to people or talking to our kids or talking to anybody. But, but he says, see then that you walk circumspectly. See then that you live your life, listen to this, circumspectly, speck, speck, looking, circum, around. See then that you walk Looking around. Some translations say, see then that you walk carefully. Some translations say, see then that you walk accurately. And then that, that, you've got to tweak that a little bit to get the same idea. But all those words have, have this idea. He says, I want you to live your life walking carefully. I'm going to use that terminology. Carefully looking around. Really the idea is that everything you do. It's, it's, it's the idea of a of a tightrope walker. If you've been to the circus, or I guess anywhere where you're having to balance yourself, it's the idea of, of putting one foot in front of the other and carefully balancing yourself and looking at every step that you take. I used to could do this real well, but I can't, it's hard for me to stay balanced now. And you've been there where, where that, that, that tightrope walker, he or she is balancing himself or herself, and they're, and they're watching every step they take, right? They don't run across the high wire. They don't just run across. You don't see gymnasts running across the balance beam, but they're carefully thinking about it, and they're carefully looking at every single step. I think that's what he's saying. And may I say that that's something that not all of us, not all Christians do that like they should, in my judgment. Now, this is the principle stated. He doesn't say you need to be careful when you do this or when you do that. He says you just need to be careful how you walk. You need to look around. You need to pay attention to, I think he's saying, you need to pay attention to every single step that you take. And sometimes we don't do that like we should. I've used this illustration just about since it happened to me. I, I, I'm going to use it. Some of you in this audience have heard it multiple times, but I'm going to use it again because some of you haven't. When I was a student at Florida College in, back in 1976, those first few weeks uh, when school started, when we would have chapel assembly, a couple, a couple of months into the first school year, when we had chapel, I loved the singing. I mean, I just, that just, I just loved that. And so... At that point in time in my life, I wasn't as interested. I was interested, but not the way I needed to be, even at that time, but in spiritual things as I should. But I would go into that assembly, and when we would sing the song, I'd pay very close attention. I'd I love to sing, so I would sing. And typically when someone would get up to speak, I wouldn't pay attention to the speaker as much if I had other things to do. And so... One morning, one particular morning in the fall, I think it was either in November or December... Uh, on the way to chapel, a couple of girls who were friends of mine said to me, they said, have you read the paper? And I said, no. They said, should I? They said, you need to go read the paper. We had played Hillsborough Community College the night before. It was our big rival, and we'd beaten them. And there was a huge article, again, in the newspaper. Again, some of you folks don't understand what the newspaper is, but there used to be newspapers. And, and the article was in the newspaper, and so they said, and you need, you need to get one, send it to your mom. They said, your picture's in there, and they talked about you in the article. And I said, well, I'm going to go get me one. So I went and got 25 papers and <laughs> sent 24 to my mother. I don't remember exactly what, but, but I, got the, I got the article, or got the newspapers, and I opened up the, I got this is a sports page. You know, I like it as I threw everything else, but I kept the sports page. And when I got to chapel after the song, I said, I'm going to read that article. So I wish I, I wish I could turn around with you, but you just have to think. Here, I'm sitting down. I'm about four rows from the back on the outside as you walk in the back, the left side of the auditorium. And I'm about four rows back, and, and, I, and I, I know I, I, I shouldn't be doing this, but I, I take that newspaper, and I put it between my legs down underneath, and nobody can see it, not even the people in my row. And I, 
I start reading that article. Now remember, it's a big article. So I, I read it as far as I could, and then I opened up the paper a little bit more. And I read some more. Kept going. I opened up the paper a little bit. I kept going. I opened. And pretty soon, I was so involved in the article that it was like I had the whole thing out. I'm just reading it like I was at my house. <laughs> and a man named Almond Williams, whom some of you know. I didn't know his name at the time, but I know it now. He came up and tapped me on the back. And he said, sir, I, I never will forget it. He said, sir, some of us here are Christians, and we would appreciate it if you'd put that paper up while we're involved in this activity. You know what I did? I went, I put that paper up. And I'm sure it stunned me because here's what I remember thinking. He just said, sir, some of us here are Christians, implying that I wasn't when I was. But I wasn't walking like it. And I wasn't walking carefully. And I've told him through the years when I've seen him, he's still alive, and when I go to Tampa and when I, and when I see him, when he sees me coming, I'm going to tell you, he remembers that story as well as I do. <laughs> and when he sees me coming, he knows what I'm going to say to him. I thank him. I tell him, I said, you, you have taught me. You taught me when I was a, a freshman in college. You taught me a lesson that I will never forget. Isn't that a good lesson? And, and, and listen, it's the small things that we do, like, like what's interesting, I, I, I reach a conclusion about all of you by just watching you here. And, and you probably reach a conclusion about me by watching me. Now, hopefully I'm doing what I ought to be doing, and hopefully you're doing what you ought to be doing. But you know, there are sometimes when I go into assemblies or when I'm teaching a class or preaching, and I look in the audience, and I don't know anybody. I don't know who those people are, but I'm thinking, they don't, they don't care about God. And you know why I, say, you know why I think that? Because they're talking to their girlfriend, or they're playing with each other's hair, or they're texting, which is pretty common. Now, and, and, and you know what? And what I found out is some of those kids or some of those people are some of the finest people. But the way what they're doing says that they don't care about God. It, it, it's the same as what happened to me. They're not being careful. And Paul says you've got to be careful how you walk. And you've got to do that because why? Because the days are evil. And you've got to redeem the time. I mean, it, life goes by so fast. And, and, and the way people live their lives, if you're not careful, you're going to leave the wrong impression on people. And you can't afford to do that for yourself and for everybody else and for your influence. You can't afford to do that. So we've got to be careful how we walk. Now, that's the principle. I can't make the application for you, or you can't make it for me. But here's what I would say to you. You, need, you and I all need to be honest about what happens to us. And, and, and what I would suggest is that you go back and individually just evaluate your life and, 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 and begin to say to yourself, what, what do I do? How do I live my life? What, what am I 24 hours a day involved with? And, and what does that say not only to God about me, but what does that say to everybody else about me? What does it say to my spouse? What does it say to my kids? What does it say to my God? What does it say to my brothers and sisters in Christ? And, and what I have found, that, it, that when I do that, that there, there may not be, and I don't mean this in a boastful kind of way, there may not be any wholesale changes that I have to make, but I'm going to tell you what, every time I think about it, every time, I always go back and tweak. There's always something that I need to do better, always, every day. And if we're not walking carefully, we won't think about those kind of things. And if we're not careful, God's going to hold us accountable. What? He said, don't walk like the Gentiles walk. You walk like somebody who's heard and been taught in Jesus. And when that happens, you'll be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Your mind will change. And when your mind starts being careful, you won't just sit down and turn on television. You won't just say, let's go to the movies. You, you, won't, you won't just say, I think I'll just, I'll just wear this today. You'll give thought to everything you do. Because you know that it only takes just a small thing to say something that you don't want to say. And if that 
if that's something that you don't spend a lot of time thinking about, I hope that Alma Williams shows up at your house. Because <laughs> it'll, it'll make you better. It'll make me better. I'll look at one other thing with you. Look at chapter 5. I don't know where my glasses are now. Chapter 5, I want you to go back up to verse 3. This, this is a... As I, as I read these, this is, gets, gets more specific, but then it doesn't. Okay, I want you to listen to these verses. He says, let's begin in verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love. As Christ also has loved us, and given Himself for us an offering, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And then verse 3 says this, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Have you ever noticed that he uses a phrase in both of those verses that's pretty similar? It's not, it's not identical, but it's similar. And the phrase is, as is fitting for saints. Now he says, fornication? No. Christian can't be involved in it. I don't think we have much prob problem understanding that fornication is wrong, do we? And there may be some nuance to that. I mean, and, and, and understandably. So we may have to work through some of that in terms of, well, what is and what isn't. And I, I understand all that. And, and sometimes we have to get deep into words and find those things out. But for, for the most part, we know what that means. We know we shouldn't be involved in that. All uncleanness, he says. Foolish talking, coarse jesting. He talks about those things. And so he gets pretty, he gets pretty definitive. But he says, and there are just things that don't fit. One more story for you. That same freshman year of college, my mother sent me, I, if I recall, she sent me $100 in cash. Now, 1977, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money now. Not as much as it was. Then. But for my parents to send me $100 in 1970, that was huge. And she sent it to me. She said, Kenny, I want you to go, I want you to go buy you a new, some new clothes for the banquet. I said, okay. Thank you. I, you know, I'd call. That's back when you couldn't just pick up your phone and call your mom and you had to wait in line and Wait till after 11. You remember all that? And people be mad at you because you were using a payphone and the line of 12 deep. Anyway, I, I digress. But she said, I want you to go buy yourself a suit. And I said, okay. I went to a store in university called, a mall called Mr. Man. Now, I didn't, I didn't look like I look now. I was much thinner. Uh, I'm the same height. But when I walked in that store... There were two, I remember this very vividly, there were two girls, only two girls. I, there was nobody else in the store at the time, and I walked in, and two girls about my age both came toward me and said, may I help you? They said, may, may we help you? I said, yeah, yes, you can. And she's, I said, I'm looking for a suit. Now, I want to ask you a question. In 1977, what kind of suit do you think I was looking for? Leisure suit. That's exactly right. Yeah, with a collar. So I, I, see, I said, yes, ma'am, I need a suit. And, and she, here's a question she asked me. She said, well, how much money do you have to spend? She got me because I told her. I told her exactly how much money I had. She said, you need to come back here. I, I, I wasn't about, I should never have spent $100 on a suit. Never. But I, she, she took me to the back of the store, and we kept passing suits. And I'm thinking, why are we passing all these suits? And the reason we passed all those suits is because Mr. Man wasn't a store for tall people. But they were going to get my money, and I was going to get some suit one way or the other. So we go to the back, to all the way to the back. And she kept, you know how they, they looked through the racks? And she kept doing this, and I kept following her, and the girl behind me was behind me, so I couldn't get out. So they kept doing this. And finally, she got almost into the rack. She said, I think this will fit you. And it was a... It was a, a pale blue leisure suit. And she, she took it off the rack. And she said, and I thought, I looked at things, I said, that, I, I thought to myself, that's not going to fit me. It didn't matter. She said, you need to try it on. I took it. Nobody else was in the store. I took it. I went in the waiting room, or in the waiting room, the dressing room. <laughs> I'm at the wrong office. I went, in the, I went in the dressing room, and I put that leisure suit on. And I'm telling you what, folks. I walked out. I couldn't breathe. 
It, it, it would have been better off if I'd have just jumped into it. I'd have gotten into it quicker. I had to, I had to, buttoning it and zipping it and all the things I had to do, it, it was as tight as anything that I ever had. And I walked out. And you know what those girls said to me? That looks great on you. And you know what I did? I bought that thing. You know how many times I wore it? One time. And I was miserable the whole night. And I'm sure I looked miserable to a lot of people. And I'm sure I looked, just looked miserable anyway because it was so tight. But that suit didn't fit. And I knew it didn't fit. But I was convinced by those two pretty girls from USF that knew what they were doing to me. I was convinced to buy that suit that was unfit for me to wear. Now, I just want to make this application about those, those two verses. I think and I believe when you're taught by Christ how to walk, that you and I know what fits a Christian and what doesn't fit a Christian. The issue is not that we don't know. The issue is sometimes is we don't like what we know. That's the issue. So Paul didn't say uncleanness and fornication and these 76 other things a Christian ought not. He didn't say that. He said uncleanness, fornication, coarse jesting, filthy talk, and things that don't fit a Christian. He says, you think about it yourself. He just said your, your mind needs to be removed, re renewed. And you need to learn Christ. And, and, and what I think he's saying to them is what he's saying to us. Just, just when you think about what God has taught you in his word and what the Lord teaches and what his inspired writers, when you think about what they've told us, is it that hard to figure these things out? Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that, that we, may, we don't have some battles and we don't have some things we're trying to figure out. But when it comes to walking and carefully looking at how we live our lives, I think we know what we ought to do. But living in the world in which we live where those issues, those lines become more blurred, it makes it difficult for us. Not because it should, but because... We like what we like. And we feel a certain way. And we don't want our conscience sometimes to get involved. And we don't want our decisions to be questioned and all those kind of things. But yet, if we're a true disciple of Jesus Christ, we've got to be careful about what we do. So tonight, just evaluate yourself. I'm, I'm not indicting anybody. I don't, I don't know what you do. You don't know what I do. I'm not... I'm not saying you're guilty of sin. I'm just saying evaluate yourself and ask yourself, do I walk carefully? Or am I walking like the rest of the Gentiles walk? In the futility of my mind, not, not paying the kind of attention that I need to. And if you'll do that, it will, I think, it will help you be better. It'll help your walk, your life as you walk with God. It'll help it to be better. And you'll live more carefully. And I, I hope that that's, that's really all I want this lesson to accomplish, that it will allow you to go back and review maybe and renew your mind in different ways and say, these are some adjustments that I need to make. Like I told you Monday night, and really in all these lessons, one reason I preach the lessons that I'm preaching this week is because they help me so much. Because I'll tell you, there, there are things even today that if I could go back and change, I would. What about you? There are ways I've spent my time that, that aren't the best ways. There might have been things I've looked at that weren't the best things to look at, or there might be things that I've done in my life that I shouldn't have done, or that there were better choices for me to make. And so as a Christian, as a disciple, as somebody who wants to walk, live my life each day, and behave like God wants me to behave, these principles, if applied, can help me do that. So I hope that that's what this lesson has done for you tonight. That's it. Thank you so much for listening. You, you listen so well, and I really do appreciate it. If you have a spiritual need tonight that we can help you with, give yourself to God in a spiritual way. Sin is what separates you. He's the only one that can solve that need in your life. And if we can help you accomplish that, let that be known by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.